This episode is brought to you by Klaviyo, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Klaviyo, you can activate all your customer data in real time, connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels, guide your marketing strategy with AI-powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance, deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale, and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Klaviyo. Learn more at klaviyo.com slash Spotify. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash Spotify. Welcome to The Waves, Slate's podcast about gender, feminism, and leaning all the way in. No, no, even further. Come on, lean in with me just a little bit more. There you go. Every episode, you get a new pair of feminists to talk about the thing we can't get off our minds. And today you've got me, Shayna Roth, senior podcast producer here at Slate. You ever read a book? And it's so mind-blowing that it becomes your whole identity. Like it hits you at just the right time in your life when you're in just the right place and it worms itself into your subconscious and it's all you can think about and it's all you want to think about for months. Like you just feel seen for the first time. So when I read this book, I just, I punched the air. I I punched the wall. I wanted to scream. I was like, thank God. Someone gets it. That's NPR political reporter Danielle Kurtzleben. You'll hear a lot more from her later in the show. The book she's talking about is Lean In, Women, Work, and the Will to Lead. It came out in 2013 and was written by Sheryl Sandberg, former COO of Facebook, and Nell Scoville. But let's face it, it's really Sandberg's book. It was a smash when it came out. The book hit the New York Times bestseller list and stayed there for more than a year, sold more than 4 million copies within five years, and was a game changer for women everywhere. And Sandberg was all over the news. Here's 2020 anchor Elizabeth Vargas. Cheryl Sandberg is one of the most powerful women in the world. At 43, she's the chief operating officer of Facebook and a billionaire. And you could say she's lonely at the top. Women have been 14% of the top jobs in corporate America for 10 years. 10 years of no progress. Her new book, Lean In, has ignited a firestorm as a sort of feminist manifesto for the sex It was a self-help tome meant to help women achieve more in the workplace. The back jacket of the 2015 printing promises that Sandberg, quote, examines why women's progress in achieving leadership roles has stalled, explains the root causes, and offers solutions that empower women to achieve their full potential, end quote. Sandberg leveraged the concept into a company called Lean In. It aims to help women succeed and, quote, create an equal world. This all kicked off 10 years ago, and in the decades since, the shine of Lean In has really started to come off. It's become a punchline, like for comedian Sarah Tolomach. I got that book, Lean In. Do you guys know about that book? It's supposed to be like self-empowering for women in the workplace. I've just been doing a lot of that at work, just kind of like leaning in (laughs) and then swishing my tits in together like this. I'm like, oh my God, I forgot my reports. (laughs) I think that's what the book's about. I haven't read it yet, Um, but just crushing it in the corporate world. The hashtag girl boss idea or movement or whatever you want to call it has really risen up from that lean in crowd. And intersectional feminists have had a lot of critiques like this TikTok from a user named Rachel Turner. Yeah, I just, I don't do girl boss culture because what they mean when everybody can be here is you can only be here if you have a message that goes with the grain, you are thin and you are white and you are straight. And they'll say that's not true, but it is. And yes, lean in feminism does have a lot of problems, but Danielle would argue that there's a lot in the rubble worth saving. Slamming lean in and Sheryl Sandberg in a non-nuanced way, I want to be clear there, I, I... I think that contributes to a narrative that, man, feminists keep screwing up. They just keep doing it wrong. All the people who are in who say these loud, prominent things, ju- they ke- they keep being bad people. It's like, no, this was one step. This was one, this was a book that opened a lot of people's eyes and was also woefully incomplete. It can be both. Ten years later, we're re-examining Lean In and trying to figure out what it means to be a good feminist. All this and more on The Waves when we come back.
This episode is brought to you by Flamingo. Women's bodies are at the center of today's cultural conversations. We face overt regulations that dominate the headlines, but we also face quiet regulations so entrenched in our everyday lives that decisions around our bodies and how we feel about them are no longer ours alone to make. Because so much of what women experience is shrouded in secrecy, treated as an afterthought, or just blatantly ruled by societal expectations and norms, the simple act of exchanging stories becomes the most powerful tool we can use to stay informed. Introducing Unruly, an eight-part podcast from Flamingo highlighting the not-often-discussed ways women's bodies are subjected to needless oversight. Hosted by writer, curator, and activist Kimberly Drew, Unruly tackles conversations around body neutrality, wellness capitalism, menopause, and more. Because information is power and your body is your business. Unruly is available wherever you get your podcasts. Learn more at shopflamingo.com slash unruly. This episode is brought to you by the Human Rights Campaign, Equality for All Without Exception. The Human Rights Campaign envisions a world where every member of the LGBTQ plus family has the freedom to live their truth without fear and with equality under the law. Powerful people are bullying LGBTQ plus kids and threatening LGBTQ plus rights, especially targeting transgender and non-binary people. The Human Rights Campaign is on the front lines, mobilizing to stop dangerous propaganda and stop legislating hate. With more than 3 million members, the Human Rights Campaign is empowering supporters countrywide and providing tools to the community and allies to fight back. By joining the Human Rights Campaign today, your support helps change the narrative and change laws. It's time to make it uncomfortable for those pushing division and hate and to hold up LGBTQ plus heroes. Donate today by visiting hrc.org slash donation and get your free sticker today. Make a generous gift this giving season and support the LGBTQ plus community and you'll receive the iconic Human Rights Campaign Equal Sticker. Welcome back to The Waves. I'm Shana Roth and I'm joined now by honestly one of my favorite recurring guests, Danielle Kurtzleben. Danielle, welcome. I am so touched to be one of the favorites. This they, seriously, my heart is warm. I'm I'm so excited to be here. When I asked you what would you like to talk about, one of the things that you said is I'm working on a piece about Lean In, and all of us immediately here at the Waves were like, "Ooh, we did our own version of <laughs> Leaning In." <laughs> So we're going to start by taking a new look at that old book. Lean In was written by Nell Scoville and Cheryl Sandberg, she of the Facebook fame, and was published in 2013. Now, you read it, and I want to know, where were you at professionally and sort of like as a person when it came out? And what was your initial reaction to Lean In? So in 2013, I was working at U.S. News and World Report. It was my first full-time job as a journalist. I had been a journalist for about three years, and so I was still pretty green and also was relatively new to the working world. I had worked and kind of bopped around for a few years before finally busting into journalism. And so I had some experience of various workplaces in a a few industries and had definitely had my moments of discomfort and that itch in the back of your brain of like, I don't like how this workplace is run. I don't like what is happening to me at, at this restaurant, in this law firm, in the wherever, you know. Uh, and also, uh, you know, in my first job as a journalist, I feel comfortable saying that I dealt with some sexism in various uh, facets of that job. And so when I read this book, I just... I punched the air. I, I punched the wall. I wanted to scream. I was like, thank God. Someone gets it. And I it it was just a feeling of you're not crazy. Like, really, you're not. I'm going to put words to the stuff that you have been experiencing, including the ways that I had been sabotaging myself and that other women did, too, do, too. You know, not sitting at the table literally and figuratively. Uh belittling yourself, trying to be too humble, just not being assertive. There was so much in this book that I read and I went, oh, God, I do do that. And also I see other women doing that. And also I see men talking over women in meetings, all of that. So my reaction was, 
oh, I can breathe. I, I'm not an insane person. So I was I was fully lean in pilled. I, I, I will happily cop to that. Totally true. I mean, it sounds like the whole lean in idea and the movement that kind of stemmed from it, the lean in woman, it changed your perspective in a lot of ways. Was it just that feeling of like, I'm not the only one who feels like I'm being weirdly discriminated against because of my gender on a daily basis? Or was it more than that? Well, it was more than that. It was a feeling of power, not of not that you have power in your workplace because I was, you know, low in the pecking order. Of course I didn't. But the feeling that, OK, here are steps I can take. It's the sort of rush you get from any self-help book. And to be clear, this whether or not it's marketed as such, this is very much a self-help book. This is a book that is giving you concrete, actionable steps that may or may not work to, OK, you are not getting what you want, what you need. You are not being treated the way that you should. All right. Here's what you can do. And it was any woman in the workplace or non-man in the workplace knows what an insurmountable challenge it can be to try to overcome sexism or, or any ism. Uh, and it can feel so difficult. It is so difficult. And so it, it felt like, well, at least here's something. Here's a thing I can do. Uh, and of course, that that's a double-edged sword, because which we can, of course, get into. Because, of course, a valid criticism of Lean In is that it focuses on the personal, on the individual, not on the systemic. Yeah, let's get into some of those problems that you admit and like that have sort of been widely circulated about the whole lean in book movement slash way of thinking. You know, it doesn't recognize intersectionality. It doesn't really recognize low wage women or really single moms. It And like you said, it puts a lot, if not all of the pressure on individual women to change the structures rather than focusing on the societal problems that keep women in the position that we're in. I feel like there's also some misguided, potentially, complaints against the book. What would you say are sort of the worst anti-lean-in takes? There's a sort of brand of take, which is the black and white. There are some, I've looked around at some of the lean-in takes, the ones at five years, so like in 2018, or when any bad news, and there has been plenty of bad news, about Sheryl Sandberg has come out, which is that oh, lean-in has been entirely discredited. Lean-in is bad. Like, lean-in feminism is the worst. Like, it makes me want to say, okay, slow your roll. Like, I I, I fully, like, we, we can criticize the hell out of this book, and there is so much to criticize. I mean, there, Bell Hooks had wonderful stuff to write about this. I mean, not positive, but eloquent writing about this book when it first came out. I'm pretty sure it was her who said, first of all, do you expect men to relinquish their power? And second of all, this book asks so little of corporate America. It asks so little of your bosses. No wonder it's po it's popular. No wonder people feel comfortable promoting it. All of that is true. I have no problem with that. But when I think about the idea of like, yeah, lean in, feminism sucks. This whole book sucks. I think like, well, I think about the phrase girl boss, for example, or girl boss, gaslight, gatekeep, all of that. Like, this is difficult to talk about because I, it, it, I fully, I, because the book is so flawed. But okay, I feel like there has been such a wave of the co-opting of valid feminist criticism of feminists within the movement saying to the movement, "Hey, our move, our movement has some real problems. It has problems with race. It has problems with class. Blah blah blah." blah. And all of that criticism is often quite valid, but then often those criticisms get co-opted by people outside the movement. For example, girl boss. You know, I, I have heard ostensibly progressive men, you know, jokingly say about a powerful or ambitious woman, girl boss, gaslight, gatekeep. And I want to say, shut up. This is not like that. This is not for you to say. This is like I also you I, do you know really what you're saying? It. There's so much of that. Or I think about like some Bill Burr comedy I have seen, which I'm not even going to get into because good Lord. But I mean, to some degree, the, when I see men, uh, particularly white men, use the word Karen, it's like, all right, like there is plenty to say, for example, about white women having been the handmaids of racism over the years, of course. And also sometimes these words, girl boss, Karen, et cetera, get thrown around as a way for 
non-feminists, often men, to feel righteous or pious while they slam women, particularly women who have gained some form of power or who are showing some form of ambition. I do think that's true. And so slamming Lean In and Sheryl Sandberg in a non-nuanced way, I want to be clear there, I, I, I think that contributes to a narrative that, man... Feminists keep screwing up. They just keep doing it wrong. All the people who are in, who say these loud, prominent things, ju- they keep, they keep being bad people. It's like, no, this was one step. This was what this was a book that opened a lot of people's eyes and was also woefully incomplete. It can be both. Yeah, I feel like what is lacking when the conversation turns to to be a feminist or not to be a feminist. I mean, you hit it right there. Nuance. We're lacking nuance. So you and I are going to unpack some of that nuance in just a minute. But first, we're going to take a break. And if you want to hear more from Danielle and myself on another topic, please check out our Slate Plus segment, where today we're talking about the new movie on Netflix, May, December. Yes. <laughs> I'm so Bong. excited. <laughs> Apple Gift Card is a practical gift that unlocks a world of entertainment and fun. You can send it via email or give a physical card to your loved ones. Your friends and family can spend it on their favorite Apple services, including Apple subscriptions. Apple Gift Card can be used to buy all things Apple. Products, accessories, apps, games, movies, TV shows, iCloud Plus, and more. Visit apple.com for details and to send Apple Gift Cards to your friends and family this holiday season. This episode is brought to you by Seed. Seed's DS01 is a two-in-one probiotic and prebiotic designed for whole body health. Formulated with 24 clinically and scientifically studied strains, DS01 offers benefits in and beyond the gut. See why DS01 is the probiotic recommended by top doctors and nutritionists. Go to seed.com slash Spotify for 25% off Seed's DS01 daily symbiotic. Welcome back to The Waves. I'm Shana Roth. I'm here with Danielle Kurtzleben. I was recently dicking around on Instagram, like I do, and I came across, I don't know if they're memes, if they're just text. Anyway, there was an image with words that said, quote, starting a girl gang of women aggressively supporting other women. So hands up if you want in, because if we get enough people, we're totally getting jackets, end quote. And I feel like this is fun. But it's kind of sad that it exists as a thought was also my reaction to this, because lately, as I think about where women are in the world and, you know, what the hell is going on and where we're going and what kind of world we're shaping for kids like my daughter, I keep thinking about what I call woman on woman crime. (laughs) I mean, so often it seems like women are the first to bring other women down. And sometimes it's to protect powerful men, like when Andrew Cuomo's sister Madeline did some really aggressive targeting of complainants when the former governor of New York was accused of sexual misconduct or women bullying other women in the workplace. A really high profile example of accusations of this is the lawsuit against Lizzo, where her former dancers are claiming sexual harassment, discrimination, fat shaming. And granted, these are just like high profile examples and doesn't even include women who vote against their best interests, trad wives, women who undermine other women in the office, who don't stick up for each other. I mean, I feel like we could rule the world if we just stop being assholes to each other. (laughs) I mean, I okay. there are a couple things I want to address in what you just talked about. One is the Instagram feminism that you were talking about there of putting funny, uh, often legitimately funny, memes up that say quippy things like smash the patriarchy and go through the world with the confidence of a mediocre white man and putting it on a t-shirt, putting it on a tote bag, all of that. And I I am not about to tell anyone not to buy the things that resonate with them. That is lovely. It's fine. But when it comes to how much change that is affecting in the world, it kind of fits with lean in that, yeah, that might help you. That might make you feel better. And lean in does a bit more because it actually might help you gain some power in the workplace and bully for you. That's wonderful. But also, does it change things? Is it helping? So, yes, 
there there is plenty to say about women supporting other women. But the question is, is it talking about women supporting other women or is it women actually doing so? And also, what does that look like? Because the other thing, when you talked about women stopping being assholes to each other, it did make me think about assholes to whom? Because we live in an America that is increasingly uh, segregated in so many ways, where it is quite easy to be kind to the women who are just like you and increasingly So many people only associate with people so much like them, right? And a major criticism of quote-unquote lean-in feminism, of course valid, is that it is self-concerned and is not concerned with other people. And so you can stop being a jerk to the other women around you. You can support them. You can help women at your workplace by advocating for them. And that is fantastic. And I I totally am, am here for it. But... There is something to be said about being concerned with women who are not around you, with women who may not believe in the things you believe in even. And I think that is a tougher pill to swallow and also a thing that is not talked about as much. One thing that I have seen is when it comes to uh, – I've reported a lot on the on Dobbs and the overturning of Roe. And just as an outsider watching the feminist movement – during that, there has been there there was real discourse about look, rich women in blue states will be able to get the reproductive care that they want, and this is about about thinking about people who are not you. We have seen that kind of discussion happen. I I wonder uh, how how much more it might happen within the feminist community about about low wage women about you know low wage women in red states because you know blue state women are more likely to consider themselves feminists that sort of thing i feel like the feminist movement over the last couple decades has really had a lot of identity crises when sandberg and scovel wrote lean in It was in 2013, and they basically said that the feminist revolution had stalled. And so this was four years before the big hashtag Me Too movement in 2017. You had Time's Up and all of that. And during that Me Too, Time's Up uprising, you know, you had the the flood of pussy hats during the first women's march after the Trump inauguration. It felt like there was all of this, like, excitement, and it felt like, oh, yeah, you can be a feminist and be proud. Like, you can say you're a feminist now. And since then, that has really gone away, it seems like. We still have a lot of what you mentioned, the Instagram feminists, but there's not that sort of like really aggressive action being taken place anymore, at least from my perspective. And it feels like the pandemic has really laid bare how incredibly difficult it is to be a working mom and to be a woman. And yet there hasn't been those real actual solutions it feels like we've stalled again. I want to push back on some of what you said. Please I mean, do. I, I, you and I may be reading different things, curating our own different realities, uh, <laughs> talking to different people. I, I feel like I don't have that read on whether feminism is cool, quote unquote, or not, in part because I feel like it, ju- it's just never felt particularly cool to me. And it, it, I mean, it feels like the world has never particularly treated it as cool. But, 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 I also think that th- there is, there has been, and I want to be clear, I'm speaking fully as an outsider who has reported on these things, not as a person who takes a position, but watching the action taken around the overturning of Roe again. I covered the uh, election in Kansas about the, the referendum in Kansas on the constitutional amendment about Uh, reproductive choice. And there is something to be said uh, about the amount of action and effort and money, and I want to stress effort, that has been put in by uh, plenty of people who I think, many of whom I think would consider themselves feminists, around maintaining some for uh, maintaining reproductive rights. And so I think that 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 definitely still exists. But you are absolutely correct that progress change is so slow. It is so slow and often non-existent. My husband 
Like, I, I remember when Me Too first started happening, I turned to a coworker and I said, wait, pe- people care about this? We can talk about the guys who, like, we've all, I had just been ignoring to myself the amount of, like, you know, some man at the workplace telling me I have nice legs. Like, shut up. Like, just, I, oh my God. Like, I, I, I had not even admitted to myself how angry this stuff made me and realizing, like, it was a, it was a, a moment like reading Lean In. Like, no, you're not crazy. This is terrible. Like, when people say, don't be alone, don't be alone with that boss guy, we can complain That's a problem. about that. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> That's I just not blew how out my should microphone. Be. <laughs> yes. But like, I hadn't even admitted to myself how big of a problem that was because I had just thought, well, what are you going to do? You know? But what does keep blowing my mind is that those moments can happen, not just in feminism, but in any number of areas. Uh, Sandy Hook, for example, the financial crisis. And afterwards, you look around and you say, did that change anything? My husband asked me the other day, what do you think has changed since Me Too? And I, I didn't know how to answer. You know, like, we have a language to talk about it. We can talk about it. But... I I don't know what has changed. I mean, so to the question of what next, how does anything get changed? My uh, my answer is potentially pretty bleak. Again, I as a journalist, I am going to be very careful here to not voice any opinions on this because that's my job. But if I were talking to anyone involved in any movement for social change in America right now, I would say change is slow and it might not come, but why would you not try? You know, like that, I, what are you going to do? Are you going to give up or not? Like, and, and change can happen. It does happen. I mean, ask people who had advocated for gay marriage. It did happen eventually, you know, it was slow and then it was fast. Like things can change, but you might not see it coming and you might not live to see it happen. I mean, that's, uh, I think when I read Lean In, I thought, yeah, the world's going to change. It hasn't. It really hasn't. And all, like, I still hear women bad mouth for being ambitious. I do. It's awful. Like so much has not changed, but what are you going to do? Like you have to keep pushing because like there's no other choice. As we are continuing to push, the last question I want to ask you is, how can one be a good feminist? I am going to once again uh, pull out and pull any personal opinions from this and say this, that first of all, to bring this back to lean in, if I could change that book, the first change I would make to put would be to slap a Surgeon General's warning on the front of it that says... <laughs> This is insufficient. Like, you can read this and feel super pumped by it and good for you. And also, if you want any form of structural change, there is so much more. There is so much else that needs to be done beyond negotiating better with your boss. You know, that is that is just the smallest of small potatoes. I mean, anyone who wants politi- who wants any form of change, I mean... I'm showing my bias as a political reporter here. Vote. I mean, if you, if there's something you want, don't just vote. I mean, you want something, get out there and advocate for it. Call whatever representatives, get involved in politics, pay, spend, you know, donate to whatever. Again, I want to be clear. Hello, friends at NPR. I am not advocating any particular policies here but anyone who wants any form of change that is how you get things changed and it's it's and it might not work but again you have to try well i don't work at npr so i'm going to say good feminists are kind to other women and people of all genders shapes and sizes good feminists are voters they vote towards their best interests and good feminists just try hard to to help make the world a better place for all of the other feminists that are coming next. I can advocate for people for women being nice to each other. You know what? <laughs> I don't think that'll get me in trouble. <laughs> Ladies, non-binary people, everyone just go, go be nice to each other. I, I, that, that is my that is my guiding opinion here. Danielle Kurtzleben, I think everybody can tell why you are one of our favorites. Thank you again so much. 
for joining us here on of the waves. Of course. Thank you. All right, everyone. I hate to end this episode on a sad note, but unfortunately, production of The Waves has been suspended. This show has been an incredibly personal project for me, and I have loved every minute of it. Thanks to you, the listeners, for your emails, your ideas, and for tuning in with us every week. And of course, thank you to the plethora of hosts and guests that we've had on the show over the years. I hope you've all enjoyed hearing from them as much as I have. We still have some great episodes ahead to close out 2023, so make sure you stick with us to the very end. That's our show this week. The Waves is produced by myself, Shayna Roth, and Vic Whitley-Berry. Daisy Rosario is Senior Supervising Producer, and Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio. We would love to hear from you. Please still email us at thewaves at slate.com. The Waves will be back next week. Different host, different topic, same time and place. When you save on auto insurance for driving safe with USAA Safe Pilot, you'll feel like a big deal. Even in a traffic jam. Save up to 30% with USAA Safe Pilot. Restrictions apply. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and the Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts. DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe. No.